Welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Neeru Tandon from VSSD College, Kanpur. This module, the third paper, 19th century English literature is on John Ruskin. This has been written by Dr. Bina Agarwal. In this module, sufficient information is being provided on the creative and personal profile of John Ruskin. There is an elaborate and comprehensive analysis of his two essays, Definition of Greatness in the Work of Art and Pathetic Fallacy. These essays are contained in the volume titled Modern Painters. The introduction will help to get an insight into the life literary achievements and artistic vision of great writer John Ruskin. The analysis of essays along with prose style of Ruskin will open the windows to Ruskin's artistic theories and his vision. Now before we understand Ruskin, it is very important to understand the age. Ruskin belonged to Victorian age, the later half of the 19th century. And Victorian age, it had different socio-cultural and literary background. With the expansion of industrial economy, awareness for democratic values and rational grounds for faith, English prose during Victorian age emerged as a patent tool of social criticism and aesthetic creed. Writers were obsessed by the mood of despair and disillusionment. The old order had been collapsed. The rational and scientific approach to religion, religious faith shattered existing values and man's faith in the existence. Now, when we talk about John Ruskin, as a writer, some of the things he followed, but on certain issues he differed. Ruskin, the influential voice of Victorian age, was born in 1819 in London in the family of a wine merchant. He got his education at Oxford but his upbringing was in a very, very strict atmosphere. From his father, he inherited the love for reading of the books and from his mother, he got inspiration for teaching the Bible. He really loved teaching Bible and his command over Bible is evident from the fact that in his prose, in his essays, he has quoted from Bible profusely. In 1848, he married to a Scottish lady for whom he wrote a delightful story. The name of that story was The King of Golden River. His marriage ended in failure, separation and disappointment. His father died in 1864 and he donated all his parental property in charity. He didn't give anything to Ruskin. After the death of his father, he left London and settled in Brandwood close to the lake country. Yes, the same lake country to which the favorite author Wordsworth was also attached. In 1870, he got a prestigious opportunity to serve at Oxford University as the professor of fine arts. Now, Ruskin's literary achievements, they owe much to his experience at the Oxford University. His literary contribution is far and wide. It is varied as well as sublime. In his literary career, he devoted 21 years of his lifetime in art criticism and subsequently he turned to social and then 
literary criticism. Art criticism can be viewed in modern painters, seven lamps of architecture and the stones of Venice. While social criticism is there in unto the last crown of wild olive, seam and modern painters as well. It is very important to understand Ruskin's visions and his thoughts before understanding the critical appreciation of his essays. Ruskin is one of those artists whose vision surpasses the self-imposed limitations of his style and subject matter and with great depth and skill, he follows an underlying unity of ideas from painting to political and from architecture to agriculture. In the book Modern Painters, he refers on the essential principles of art and gives emphasis to the fact that great art must be the manifestation of his ideas that are embodied divine truth that is perpetual and timeless. Some major points that you should always consider before going through Ruskin and they are that he said that great art must be the manifestation of great ideas. As per him, an artist is a preacher. Relationship between moral principles and aesthetic principles cannot be avoided. Realization of morality is the basis of art. He emphasized that art strengthens the foundation of nature. He also said that art mitigates the horrible reality of industrialization. Now, when we talk about his vision, his vision is that good for oneself is the good for the entire humanity. He said, I quote his line, to do the best for yourself is finally to do best for others, unquote. So he wanted that an artist, a writer, he should think about himself. If he wants to do something good for others, if he wants to do something good for the society, first he should be satisfied. First he should be convinced. Then only he can do good to others. That was his principle on which he based his essays. Labor is also a mode of creative expression and it generates pleasure and fulfillment. So idleness is no solution. Ruskin was religious in his faith, but instead of taking recourse to blind orthodoxy or superstition, he dictates the rigidity in moral rectitude. To him, all the commandments of gods are summed up. He said, I quote his lines, Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall added unto you, unquote. Now, Ruskin had a humanitarian ideology. He thought good for all and it was constructed in unto the last, that is his famous work, significantly and that influenced Mahatma Gandhi's idea of truth, justice and humanity. Several times Mahatma Gandhi mentioned the influence of Ruskin upon his writing and upon his character. Ruskin made serious efforts to define the significance of art in context of human values. His idea of social reform is unconventional because it includes the beauty of the life and labor of working classes. So whenever we talk about Ruskin's humanitarian ideology, we must take into account that Ruskin was different from Victorian ideals in the sense that 
is orthodox that is superficial he has his own point of view and he wanted to convey that and he did it beautifully through his essays now when we talk about modern painters as a work which became very famous it was published between 1843 to 60 and it was divided in five volumes the major thing discussed over there was in defense of the mechanism of painting and art he pleaded for the principles of truthfulness justice and warmth of feeling now you see that whenever he was pleading for justice he was pleading for truthfulness so he was just giving you certain ways where you can just lead by an example now he said that art must be free from the burden of fear and affectation for great art one must be truthful to nature you know that 19th century literature has got a special characteristic that nature is a supreme power in the uh, literature by various writers he also loved nature but he said one must be truthful to nature seeks scientific foundation for aesthetic theories now victorian age was the age of science so he could not avoid that science and scientific foundation is needed if even you are going for aesthetic pleasures so somewhere it is a mingling of art and science he also stressed on relationship of art and morality only art is not sufficient if it is not giving a moral lesson morality should be infused with art in different forms contribution to pre raphaelite movement is also noteworthy now when we come to another essay by him that is definition of greatness in art so it is the chapter second of the volume first of modern painters and reflections on painters intellectual power to achieve the timeless effect of creative art is discussed in detail he also tried to bring a comparison between poetry and painting now it is something very interesting when you just compare these two important things poetry and painting specifically what pre raphaelites did they did the same thing most of the pre raphaelite poets they were painters first so a very beautiful comparison of poetry and painting is just very very important to understand painting of art noble and expressive language is also discussed now expressive language possesses the delighting the senses he said that if any literature delights the senses and if you just express that in a beautiful language and language gets command over sentiments then it delights the senses for the effectiveness of art artist must use images or symbols that are forceful and effective but these forceful and effective symbols they should not be out of place these symbols should be well connected with the topic concerned he refers to the paintings of e i lancier and because he loved them very much now he also talks about comparative importance of language and thought previously he talked about the comparison of poetry and painting and the next thing that he talks is the comparison of language and thought like thoughts are powerful but if they are not being presented in a powerful language then they will not be that effective so there is a connection there is a comparison between language and the thought in which the language in which language the thoughts are being presented in fact language and thoughts they are complementary 
if you don't have proper thoughts then good language is useless and if you don't have language to be used properly then thoughts are meaningless he recommends the cause of simple expression for naked beauty and this is between the quotes naked beauty he has got this special definition for this terminology he presented difference between decorative and expressive language now like wordsworth said that poetry should be in the language of the common man but ruskin he said that it is not always true somewhere there is use of decorative language as well the acceptable language is that which increases intrinsic excellence he refers to the works of rubens van dyck and rembrandt nobility of thoughts was also there to be discussed and he said that the work of art appealing sensual pleasure determines the effectiveness of art another essay by ruskin that is very famous and its title is of pathetic fallacy this essay of pathetic fallacy is the chapter 12 of volume 3 of modern painters in this essay ruskin talks about the creative artist and creative artist must express with ease he should avoid fanciful expressions truth and authenticity are the foundation of excellence now he discussed two kinds of fancy willful fancy and natural fancy you must be remembering coleridge also when he discussed imagination and fancy there he discussed two types of imagination while in this essay ruskin describes two kinds of fancy willful fancy and natural fancy he talks about violent emotion and distort perception and then he talks about pathetic fallacy what is pathetic fallacy pathetic fallacy is the false perception of object under the heat of turbulent emotions he adhered to the principle of truthfulness whether you are dealing with pathetic fallacy even then this truthfulness should be there according to him there are three ranks of men number 1 governed by restrained passion number 2 those who perceive worthy number 3 who perceives highly in spite of strong feeling artists are likely to take allurability and fancy born out of truthful feelings lead to authenticity so again the important point is truthfulness the truthfulness is the major ingredient which should not be avoided by the artist excellence of a work of art depends on ectum of feeling and command over it he said i quote his lines from the essay all violent feelings have the same effect they produce in us a falseness in all our impressions of external things which i would generally characterize as pathetic fallacy now after discussing these two essays a very important point regarding ruskin is to understand his prose style ruskin is famous ruskin is successful because of his prose style Ruskin has been acknowledged as one of the greatest stylist in English literature because of his language. There is a variety and flexibility in his style. He modifies his prose style according to the need of the subject matter. In his prose writings related to art criticism, his prose style reflects the impact of milton's style john milton it is embellished philosophical and is remarkable for exceptionally long sentences this is not all 
in his writings there is a display of ornamentation rhythmic construction of sentences coupled with reflective mood it makes his style flowery but obscure at the same time sometimes it becomes very difficult to understand ruskin's style of writing ruskin's language because he used so much of ornamentation in his prose writings related to social and economic issues ruskin adopts the practice of simplicity direct expressions and controlled style the sentences are shorter but replete with figure of speeches and biblical allusions i told you that love for bible has come to him from his mother still his style in all his writings is remarkable for eloquence born of intense feeling clarity philosophical richness and the expression of learning in context of the sensuousness of his style he has been compared to keats his sentences are jeweled with phrases now one more very important thing that one must remember whenever you are discussing the prose style of john ruskin that there is intrinsic artistic beauty and rhythm in his style he adopted the practice of presenting the details vaguely but collectively the idea is that there is unity and harmony in his construction of sentence in spite of apparent disorder he presents the details with imaginative gleam that was a word used by many critics for him now his sensibility as a painter modifies his prose style he was a painter and sometimes while writing he used to present a word picture he used a wide variety of colors in descriptions sound sensibility it also marks a significant effect in his description he constructs his sentences with effective rhythms and organized harmonies again the frequent use of biblical text and phrases that enriched his prose style however his extreme indulgence of emotions avoiding the presence of intellect leads to extravagance of ornamentation and the use of superlatives you know this is the limitation of ruskin as a prose writer this is the basic limitation that this over use of ornamentation could not be controlled by him however the picaresque and exuberant passion influenced the reader against the blemishes of styles in the formation of his prose style he was influenced by another writer and who was he none other than carlyle ruskin's prose style can be defined as a fine blending of sublimity and simplicity ornamentation and effectiveness is spontaneity and affection whenever we discuss the limitations there is one more thing which cannot be avoided that there is a variety and exceptional depth in his observations but it leads to confusion and astonishment it is difficult to get at the roots of meaning without taking the help of appropriate guiding clues he writes without having a true insight into the subject matter he not even discusses the cultural background of that particular thing that he is discussing in detail so it seems that he is talking on the surface level whenever he used to choose any subject for his essays he never did proper research in the subject he started writing modern painters without appropriate understanding of classical italian painters and that was considered as a great limitation of ruskin as a writer 
in the end i will like to quote some lines from his essays when love and skill work together expect a masterpiece quality is never an accident it is always the result of intelligent effort in order that a man may be happy it is necessary that he should not only be capable of his work but a good judge of his work he advised writers and said say all you have to say in the fewest possible words or your reader will be sure to skip them and in the plainest possible words or he will certainly misunderstand them unquote to ruskin art doesn't just refer to a pretty picture art to him is the natural expression of humanity's commune with truth beauty and the divine that's how he sees it In a lecture at Oxford he remarked that I quote the teaching of art is the teaching of all things unquote and he believed that art was the measure of a nation's well-being the art of any country is the exponent of its social and political virtues just to sum up i would like to remind you that john ruskin was a great essayist his command over language his command over words his art of weaving words in the right place is exemplary his truthfulness humanity honesty are the virtues which affected mahatma gandhi as well he has a message to give to the world one must go through john ruskin's prose to understand the poetic word and literary word in a better way thanks for visiting epg patshala